One of the examples in the book that I, that I really love uh, is the story of Brett Goldstein, the open table uh, operating officer who wound up going into police work and then revamped the, the method by which the Chicago Police Department was tracking mur the mur murders or, or where murders were happening. Um, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that and how that's a great example of an individual who uh, was acting in a way that was uh, unsiloed. Well, here's an interesting lesson for entrepreneurs. Um, one of the stories I tell in my book is Brett Goldstein, who basically was working for Open Table, classic tech startup. He's a classic tech entrepreneur. And after 9-11, he suddenly decided he wanted to give something back. And so he took an incredibly unlikely move and jumped into the Chicago police. Huge culture shock. I mean, most of his entrepreneur friends thought he was completely mad. Because apart from the fact that Chicago police is a pretty dangerous, tough place to work, most tech entrepreneurs would rather go to Timbuktu than work for a stodgy government bureauc bureauc bureaucracy or the public service. And yet, although Brett found it hard, it completely opened his eyes to another way of thinking and being. And he ended up trying to combine those two words by bringing some of his know-how from the tech sector into the Chicago police operations and changing the way that they actually looked at murders or potential murders. And it was incredibly satisfying. I mean, he did a lot of good in terms of trying to change some of the thinking inside the Chicago police and later Chicago City Hall. But he also got a perspective that I would bet in the future, now that he's back in the private sector, could end up being very enriching too in many ways. So the key message is, don't just stay in one lane all your life. Have the courage to actually take a few gambles and go and look at the world in different, uh, different ways because it could actually pay dividends. And just lastly, that's something that Steve Jobs did. Um, he often says the reason why he produced such brilliant designs at Apple was because many years earlier when he was at college, or rather dropping out of college, he went into calligraphy classes. He never dreamt that would have any connection, Japanese calligraphy, with IT development. But when he actually pulled, started designing the Apple computers, they were heavily influenced by Japanese calligraphy. And so he used to say, you can't join the dots looking forward, you can only join the dots looking back. But you have to make sure you've got different dots to try and join up, and they can't all be from the same box. You in your own career have, have made a switch um, from anthropology to journalism. Um, how, how has that change affected how you, you know, help to run the Financial Times? Well, I've been a silo buster most of my life, as much by default as design. I've been a silo buster with a journalist because I've covered many, many different things. And we at the Financial Times pride ourselves on trying to rotate individuals and make sure they have a fresh vision and have the ability to actually join up the dots in their own reporting, because that's critically important. But the second way I've been a silo buster is I've actually moved from anthropology, studying micro-level communities in an academic sense, to being a journalist. And I found that very enriching because it's meant that I don't just get trapped in the same storylines and the same journalistic thinking of many colleagues. I don't just succumb to the way that, say, bankers look at the world and assume that's the only perspective you need to use in life. I can try and step back and be an insider outsider over and over again. And above all else, keep asking myself, if I was looking at, say, Wall Street from the perspective of Tajikistan, where I did my field work, would this look normal or rational? Just because everyone thinks it's the only way to do things and organize things doesn't mean that's the case if you take a wider vision. You can think creatively if you're willing to step back and just have a bit of imagination. Do you think that helped you to identify that something was going wrong in the financial markets in 2007? You were one of the early warners of a crisis coming. I'm absolutely convinced that one of the reasons why I saw the crisis coming back in 2005 or 6 was because of my anthropology training. And in fact, one of the things that led me to into this area of the markets was that back in 2004, I was asked to try and drop a memo about what we should be talking about in our commentary section at the FT. And when I looked at the financial system back in 2005 and 6, I could see that there was a lot of market chatter about, say, the equity markets or currency markets. Almost nobody was talking about debt and derivatives and credit, even though those were growing very, very fast. So I started asking the question, why? And when you asked why, I began to see that actually the system 
was pretty unstable. As one of the, the leaders of the Financial Times, are there um, elements of the organization that you see are siloed that you try to combat in any way? I am keenly aware that the media world is riddled with silos. And it's a never-ending battle because no sooner do you have a reporting team set up to cover one crisis, then you have the danger that it becomes rigid and not flexible enough to move into the next era. Luckily enough, we are at the FT are small enough to ensure that we actually always collide. You know, we work in an open plan office, we have a very collegiate culture, we try and talk to each other, we don't put reporters into very rigid reporting beats. It's quite different from many of our um, competitors. We don't have a big bureaucratic structure. We're very flat, we're very reporter driven, not editor driven, and we do rotate people. But we, like everyone else, need to take time out and need to have the resources to be able to step back from time to time and say, OK, here's what we're talking about, here's what we're reporting. What are we not talking about? What's falling between the cracks? Because that is almost certainly where the next big story is going to come. What about the traditional silos of the business side and the edit side? Are there ways that you try to promote collisions there or any benefits to doing so? Traditionally, newspapers like the Financial Times have kept the commercial side and the editorial side separate because the commercial side was really about advertising. But something that's been quite a dramatic change in the FT in the last few years is that whereas we used to get the bulk of our revenues from advertising, these days we get the bulk of our revenues from subscription. It's an amazing change and it's a real testament to how the leadership of the FT have actually grasped the nettle and tried to change with the times. Now, if you have a newspaper or a website that's primarily getting its revenues from subscription, that means it's primarily dependent on its consumers, i.e. readers, for its money. And engaging with your consumers as a journalist is entirely different from engaging with your advertisers. So it's actually much easier to create a more holistic model where you actually try to tailor content to what readers want rather than simply fire it off into the dark. Now, personally, I don't believe in producing um, a newspaper or website that's merely edited by the numbers, i.e. driven just by what we know our readers are reading and want to see. You have to be able to surprise people because otherwise people get trapped, your readers get trapped in silos themselves and end up customizing information and just reading what they think they want to see, which is basically a way to get caught in intellectual rabbit holes. You know, we as newspapers and websites have to give them a much broader view. But we journalists can talk to our consumers and we should talk to our consumers. And so we're trying to actually engage now with the commercial side in that respect in a much more creative way. And frankly, it's an incredibly time, exciting time for the media, not just for us, but for all websites, yourselves included. Mm -hmm.